Uh, thank you for everyone for turning up. It's really great to join this uh, community of practice uh, for the next hour and a half um, or so. Uh, it's going to be led by myself and my colleagues who are principally in at the University of Exeter and um, with a wider team. And we're going to do this in uh, two uh, phases, as it were, two sections to this, the first being the next um, uh, 20 minutes or half hour or so. Um, and uh, subsequently then in um, <clears throat> in the next hour, which will be uh, much more interactive. In this first part, I'm, uh, so I'm Neil Anger, I'm uh, a professor in geography at the University of Exeter and I've been working on adaptation to climate change <clears throat> in many of its dimensions uh, over the years. Um, uh, in this part, I'm going to be talking about some new research that we have um, been engaged with here in, in Exeter and with uh, collaborators. Uh, I'm getting a bit of feedback, uh, actually, uh, Peter, if there's quite a bit of unmuted. I think that's uh, great. <clears throat> uh, thank you so much. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about um, uh, adaptation actions and actually measuring, um, uh, trying to get a handle on uh, what the outcomes of having to live with, uh, with adaptation interactions are and particularly how to measure the sort of um, uh, <clears throat> wider health and well-being dimensions of the outcome of adaptation interventions. I'm going to be talking principally ar around um, in research they've been doing from flood risk interventions. Um, so that's now. Uh, I'll talk for about um, 15 minutes or so and we'll take questions. But then after 2.30, we'll switch gears and my colleague Kat will introduce a slightly different focus, which is going to be the focus of the second part, uh, which is um, uh, the role of communities uh, and community-led adaptations. Um, because we know that adaptation interventions can be top-down, they can be um, uh, resisted, they can be you know, welcomed, um, they have you know, particular outcomes and um, uh, dynamics to them. Uh, but there's a whole other set of uh, interactions, particularly around uh, those that are more spontaneous, that are led by communities. And we're going to talk about that and get your input into <clears throat> that, um, uh, that set of discussion uh, after 2.30. Okay. <laughs> so um, the, yeah, four, yeah, just a couple of uh, points to start off with, uh, with this focus on flood risk and flood risk interventions that we've been working on for uh, a number of years. Um, uh, looking at its uh, dynamics, the best way to do it, mistakes to avoid, all, uh, and you know, potential outcomes. That we know that flooding, as one of the sort of key consequences of potentially of climate change that we need to adapt to, and also you know in terms of increasing populations in the UK, uh, increasing development on floodplains and the rest. But we know that floods are traumatic to people that uh, undergo them. We know that they're disempowering and that that has negative consequences for people who, um, uh, who experience these floods and really affects their lives and livelihoods and uh, their, own, their perceptions of self and their perceptions of well-being. Um, but we also know that, that actually the types of adaptation interventions from nature-based solutions to hard engineering themselves have their own health and well-being consequences and that those are, uh, I think, underrepresented certainly in planning for uh, climate change and adaptation. Uh, what do we mean by health and well-being? Health, it should be fairly evident. Well-being, we're talking about uh, you know, how people feel, um, but it also has collective and relational dimensions uh, and it is manifest, it's observable, this, uh, you know, these dimensions of well-being in outcomes uh, of what people report, how they feel, um, uh, and other outcomes in their lives and livelihoods. So we're drawing on work across sociology uh, and social psychology and human geography to try and get into these uh, ideas of what constitutes well-being. And I think what we conclude from this is that that actually we can incorporate these into the planning and designing of adaptations, and that actually has some very positive benefits. Or you know, actually accounting for this, uh, enhancing overall well-being sense of security, um, uh, pride in place, and various other you know, positive uh, outcomes. So how do we come to those, um, uh, you know, to those findings? Um, we've done this uh, over the years, 
uh, first of all, that first point, we know that that floods have consequences um, for uh, well-being and health outcomes. And this is research by Kat, um, who's on the call, myself and colleagues uh, uh, in Lincolnshire and in uh, Somerset, going back to the, the wild winter of 2013-14 that we haven't really experienced. And um, my train from London to Exeter was delayed on Sunday. Um, Somerset was a bit of a, Somerset levels were somewhat um, um, uh, like a bit of a lake. But in the winter of 2013 and 14, they were absolutely like a sea and were like that for weeks on end. Um, and this research uh, worked with communities in Somerset and in Lincolnshire, various methods, you know, multiple multi methods uh, research. But basically, I found that the pathways to that actually made people feel uh, the trauma that floods actually caused them were to do with their lack of agency, their dislocation from home and um, their perception that their futures were not what they thought they were going to be. Uh, particularly in you know, people's place of residence, their ideas of their, um, you know, the safety of their houses and these sort of things. But it was hugely offset these negative outcomes, which are evident in um, all sorts of uh, mental health, mental ill health and uh, other outcomes, were really offset by community and really uh, positively offset by um, how people uh, how you know how people coped. So there were these multiple impacts, multiple negative impacts, which we've um, uh, documented and in many other studies, uh, including the the English National Flood Cohort Study, has uh, you know sort of um, documented and quantified some of these multiple impacts on well-being and on mental uh, state and mental ill health beyond the sort of material consequences of flooding. Um, but that collective action by people and solidarity in communities was also really central to the outcome, really ameliorate to offset some of these negative consequences and also. Um, you know, was, uh, you know, potentially help people recover much more quickly. But that's the impacts of floods themselves. Uh, what about the um, what about the interventions? What about adaptation then and what to do about it? So in our uh, latest work that we've um, uh, been doing, we've been looking uh, more directly at evaluating flood inter interventions themselves. And we've just categorized or classified these or looked at, at archetypal examples of hard engineering uh, interventions for flooding. We've looked at nature-based solutions uh, interventions, and we've also looked at a, uh, how can I put it, a slightly more um, <clears throat> extreme, slightly more um, uh, costly intervention, which is actually really moving communities, moving whole communities, uh, and uh, you know, often referred to as planned relocation. Um, so we've done this uh, in a multi-country study, and I'm not going to talk too much about this, but I'll, the main thing to concentrate here on is how do we measure the well-being or what, what constitutes well-being? Is it observable? Is it, is it um, uh, what can we say about this across these main types of interventions that we see to flood risk uh, in this country and, uh, and globally? And so we looked at uh, uh, some hard engineering uh, coastal and river um, uh, interventions in Ireland, in uh, Clontarf, which is just north of Dublin, and in Bray Town, which is just south of Dublin, the Greater Dublin area, um, and looked at people's reactions to those. The nature-based solutions we looked at were down here in the southwest, uh, in Somerset and in Devon, the Connecting the Culm project, um, uh, which uh, engaged communities in second side wetlands doing various uh, projects, and the Taunton Sponge, which was a similar um, type of intervention. Some many of you, some of you may know about these things. And we looked at managed retreat with our colleagues in West Africa in uh, in Ghana. And the design was to look at these adaptation interventions to see how these affected people in terms of their process of being involved in the adaptation, their health, their um, the environmental, the economic, and their you know, perceptions of identity. And then measured well-being outcomes to see um, uh, you know. Uh, uh, whether or not these um, areas of life that were affected by um, by adaptation actually um, resulted in changes in well-being. So <clears throat> what are the psychosocial consequences really of living with these types of interventions? I mean, you know, I have to say they are multifaceted. Um, they're often neg neglected and ignored, possibly because they are assumed to be slightly difficult to measure. Um, but certainly in uh, you know uh, big areas in social psychology uh, practice and uh, and in academia actually do this. Um, 
it does involve an interplay between you know many sort of uh, social dimensions of living conditions, social structures, how we get on with our neighbors, uh, our, our emotional and mental states. And um, you know, quite often, you know, there are various aspects of this that have been focused on, and particularly in the context of environmental risk and environmental loss around what's known as solastalgia, the idea of, you know, that things aren't quite what they used to be and um, uh, and it's uh, a grief for a loss of a place, um, eco-anxiety, um, psychological distress. Um, and these, um, uh, these sort of negative consequences on well-being have their own dynamics. They don't happen just at once and they're sort of prevalent for when an adaptation is happening or when it's, you know, sort of being event. It's actually something that evolves and persists over the long term, just like the impact of being flooded uh, does. Uh, as I say, we've then implemented these looking at uh, various uh, structures and hard engineering. These are just the examples in um, in uh, the greater Dublin area, but in Clontarf in particular, people were very resistant to this uh, you know, a uh, seawall, um, which was uh, to uh, avoid coastal flooding in the um, in the Clontarf um, suburb. Uh, but actually, there were major protests uh, against it. So these were not uncontested um, sort of interventions, and clearly had uh, consequences for life, livelihood, and uh, people's perceptions of the places that they lived. So just going back to that design, we have these different types of uh, interventions. We have these impacts and areas of life that are affected by, by uh, these consequences, such as trust and people's sense of voice, legitimacy, and actually uh, in the processes of you know, where these were being implemented, um, uh, physical and mental health, uh, measures of you know, esteem, and these are at the individual level, uh, self-efficacy, you know, your ability to uh, actually do things. So we measured these things, and then we looked at some um, uh, well-being outcomes, and I guess this is, um, you know, possibly a new uh, area to uh, at least some of us or some of you. Um, and I'm not going to report on all of these, uh, but we use standard methods to to measure people's perceptions of, you know, in effect their um, uh, uh, sort of uh, mental state, their quality of life. So this is sort of in the a realm of happiness research, as it's known. We also looked at some measures of whether or not living with these uh, adaptations increased um, mental ill health, such as anxiety. And we also looked, and I'm going to report on this just as an example, on what are known as positive and negative affect. In other words, positive emotions and negative emotions associated with, um, uh, with these uh, adaptation interventions. Uh, what we found across these, you know, sort of in six communities across these uh, three di very different interventions and obviously in three different cultural contexts um, was that lots of areas of people's life and uh, livelihood, you know, felt were perceived to be affected. Uh, and you can see that planned relocation here, virtually everybody, all areas of life were really by affected by the population's involved in this. These were, I forgot to mention, these were uh, two communities in this, uh, the coastal part of southern Ghana, the Volta Delta region, as it's known, uh, Totope and uh, Keta, where people had actually been moved, um, where the the um, settlements had actually been relocated, um, and you know clearly all areas of life, access to public space, relationship with nature, access to nature. Uh, you'll see that household insurance wasn't such a big issue there. Their life livelihoods, all these things were really affected. In terms of people living with the with other types of solutions, um, hard engineering or nature-based solutions, the impact was much lower. Um, and in terms of, for example, the hard engineering, the things that were that stood out as being what how people experienced these much more was actually to do with access to public space and access to nature and relations with nature. And those were perceived to be you near know, the greatest potential impacts of living with some of these sort of channelization and hard engineering uh, types of solutions. <clears throat> How did this affect then uh, you know, well-being? So we measured this through positive and negative effect, which is known as the PANAS scale, positive effect, negative effect scale, uh, in uh, borrowed from uh, social psychology with some of our uh, colleagues working in this area. And what you would, uh, these are just sort of correlations that show um, positive effect scores with flood intervention experience. So the more 
in the pre from the previous graph, the more you are to the right hand side there, the greater the flood intervention experience I am, how much it's affect you, then we measure how that uh, affects people's uh, positive and negative um, emotional effect, emotional response to these. So what you'd want to see is that more people are affected by this, then they should feel these positive emotions like, you know, feeling uh, uh, safety, uh, you know, feeling uh, pride, all these sorts of things. So you would, you would hope and expect that these graphs would go up and the good news is they do, but they go up for nature-based solutions and planned relocation in a greater, um, the, um, the coefficients are greater, you know, the slope is greater here uh, going up than it is for hard engineering. So that didn't make people feel that much better about themselves or that much safer. Um, and in terms of negative effect, uh, fear, anxiety, these sorts of things, you would want to see these going down. And you can see in the clear case of planned relocation that it does go down. So planned relocation in terms of positive and negative effect has a, you know, um, a desirable outcome. It makes people feel, you know, increases their positive emotions and decreases their negative emotions. But for hard engineering, you'll see this actually goes up uh, so that people have what you might say all the feels. They uh, feel both positive and negative about these sorts of things. Uh, this is a lot of detail to, to take in, um, but basically this way to look at these outcomes basically tells you that there are offsetting consequences of all these uh, flood uh, adaptation interventions uh, in terms of um, uh, how, yeah, you know, in terms of these well-being outcomes. And these well-being outcomes are well established, both quality of life measures, these uh, positive and negative effect uh, measures and uh, uh, the sort of negative consequences on mental ill health, such as uh, anxiety and stress. So these are all measurable and we propose or we uh, suggest that these, you know, should be or could be uh, built into assessments of uh, adaptation plans going forward because it's really important to, in effect, know how people feel um, about these uh, and the experience of living with these sorts of uh, interventions. So I'll go back to this to say, and um, that uh, we believe we've also talked to a, a, a group of, you know, a number of professionals in this area or, um, across these three countries. There is a demand for this information on health and well-being for, you know, what are the outcomes of these adaptation interventions. Um, this well-being, we've measured it, I have to say, principally on the individual level. Um, uh, but it has these collective and re relational dimensions related to community. And that's what we're going to come on to talk to uh, next. Uh, and we think that if we design adaptations better, we're certainly proposing this, that these they can potentially uh, avoid the worst consequences and um, uh, you know, uh, enhance overall well-being, pride in place, sense of security, and other positive um, uh, uh, perceptions of well-being. Uh, that's it. Thank you very much. I'll take some uh, questions. And just to say that the details of what I've just proposed are not yet published, so I'm afraid I can't give them to you. But you can. But I have. When you look at the, if there are links that Peter can share these afterwards uh, to some of the scientific outputs. Uh, at least the Ghana research has been published. Just published uh, last week. Uh, in fact, led by Mamuni Abu. Um, on uh, the consequences of planned relocation and some of the other references I've referred to there. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, let me stop sharing my screen and take any questions. Hi, really interesting. Um, I'm based in Devon and uh, we've got a regional climate adaptation strategy. So, um, yeah, I'm thinking about how we could maybe incorporate some of your suggestions, but I guess what methods did you use to gather this information? Was it surveys? Was it, mm. apologies if you said, and I, I didn't retain that, or, or interviews? Um, yeah, I'd be interested yeah. to know in terms of how replicable it might be. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, thank you for that. Um, yeah, I guess this is one of the big issues with this, which is uh, how simple is this to do? Yeah, can you, what sort of methods can you use? Can you do this rapidly you know, for interventions? Uh, are these results, you know, uh, replicable? Can you just borrow them and say, look, this is, you know, uh, these are the results. Uh, the straight answer to your question is this was used, uh, this was done using survey research and um, our project was funded by the Welcome Trust, which is a medical um, health related charity uh, focused on uh, health and well-being. Um, it was fairly involved. Um, yeah, and it did involve professional researchers. Uh, in uh, obviously in three countries in this uh, context. Um, 
Uh, is there a stripped down version of this? Uh, I would say that many of these aspects, I mean, it's the key thing is actually the incorporation of these ideas about well-being. And there are other simpler, uh, or uh, how can I, I'll not say simpler, I'll say cheaper, um, uh, more rapid methods to um, incorporate these as well. Um, but this was done uh, by um, a survey by postal, uh, uh, you know, collect and drop type surveys for residents in all these different places. It was done fit and in uh, different ways in the different places, but it's basically survey research. Thanks. Uh, Miranda. Hello, I'm Miranda Halston. I'm the Director of the Institution of Civil Engineers for the Southwest and also CEO of the Southwest Infrastructure Partnership. Uh, mm -hmm. um, what I'm... Um, was interested in is when you're going to launch. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you for, for that presentation. Uh, um, when are you going to launch it? And I was just wondering if we could um, bring bring you to talk at some of our adaptation pathway workshops where we're hosting for SWIT. Uh, uh, we are always, uh, as you can tell, academics are always delighted to talk. Um, so delighted to be engaged, uh, you know, with your groups, Miranda. I think that would be fantastic. Um, yeah, when are we going to launch it? I guess, uh, uh, I guess there's a certain dynamic. I'm sure there's there are. I know uh, I can see some academics uh, on here and professional researchers. Uh, there is always this. Let's hang back till we make sure the results are absolutely nailed down and they are peer reviewed uh, and in the public domain um, but there's no um but quite often that's a long and slow process um uh, and i'm i have spoken about these results and i, I know my colleagues uh, Kat and others have as well in public so from now um but in terms of release uh, we tend to do that after scientific publication you know sort of things where there are where the results are in the public record and um, and are ultimately nailed down. But I think engagement and discussions about this, um, we're very happy to uh, continue uh, at any point from now on. Uh, that would be, be great. So, so our next workshop is likely to be um, in May. So, um, yeah, if if that was a good time for you to launch it, you'd be we'd be very welcome to use our. Ooh, our that would be good. But if that's too soon for you, we're just it would be just really good to to bring you in for that one. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, Neil, lovely to meet you. Uh, my name is Emmanuel Marshall. I'm a, I'm a law carbon officer for Plymouth City Council. I'm in the fortunate position to be studying for a master's degree at the moment at um, uh, SOAS University London mm -hmm. on climate change. And I'm wondering, I'm really, really interested in matters of governance and, and adaptation to climate change. Mm -hmm. And consider, con currently considering the topic for my dissertation, so it's a very, it's a kind of a selfish question, but I was wondering from your perspective, how could someone in my position contribute, uh, you know, a piece of research that would be useful and helpful in this, in, in this sphere. So I, I'm, I'm doing this part time, you know, I've got the possibility of engaging quite widely with, with residents in my community and I'd like to do something that, that, you know, kind of contributes to this, to this subject. Um, I don't think uh, that is a selfish question, but on the other hand, it's one that everyone, you know, that I think we can all benefit from uh, thinking about, i.e. what are the, you know, what are the research gaps and, um, uh, you know, and what do we need to know about how, you know, um, these things are, um, uh, you know, um, uh, are governed uh, in a sense. So, I mean, one of the, um, one of the key questions, oh, this is just sort of, spontaneous uh, answer sort of straight up the top of my head. One of the things that we found in doing this was this um, perception among the sort of key stakeholders. I should say we had expert panels of um, uh, people in uh, an expert panel in Ireland, an expert panel in Ghana of, of quite uh, senior policymakers and the rest of it who said, yes, we really get, need to understand the consequences of adaptation before we pile into them. Um, and that quite often the cost benefit uh, an engineering, you know, sort of design, even an environmental impact uh, assessment doesn't quite do it for us. And we don't quite know this. Um, uh, and so they like to know this information and we've collected it using, how can I put it, positivist, you know, uh, scientific methods. Um, but also there are ways into this to get communities um, you know, so processes of governance by which communities can co-create these sorts of things um, and there are ways and methods uh, to do that. Uh, many of our colleagues have um, worked on these things 
uh, in the UK and internationally, for example, by empowering communities through photo elicitation, getting people to go out and say what's important to them, how they would govern the risk, what are the key risks, opportunities, um, and social dynamics of these things. For example, using these sort of photo elicitation techniques where people take photographs and then they explain it. You put up a, you know, you do an exhibition of photos, you know, all sorts of uh, 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 positive and creative ways of co-creation of this sort of knowledge so that the governance is not simply top down, but is mm. um, uh, <clears throat> comes from a, a place of demand and it comes from a, you know, a, an, a harnessing of lay and local knowledge about what these risks are and how they're doing it. And so I think something in that area, you know, uh, to our mind, to, for our team's mind, or I'm speaking on behalf of our team, I think that is you know, one of the sort of really missing parts of all this. Which, okay. which in the research that I've just reported on, we don't really do, but there are many other uh, aspects of it, and we want to get into talking about that next. Uh, Rebecca, and then I saw one other hand, possibly. Um, uh, Hello, yeah, Neil. Rebecca Hello, Neil. First. Thanks Thanks for your work. I'm on a phone, so I, I hope you'll forgive me if I uh, broaden out slightly. I couldn't see how many hands were up, and it felt like the questions were slowing. So I'm going to do a cheeky, broader question than your work. So feel yeah. free to pass on if you feel like you don't want to take this question. My question is really... Um, Broadly, it's really nice to hear about your work and to hear about the measurement of, of mm. impacts beyond mental health uh, in relation to adaptation. And, and I'm really curious about one particular aspect and whether you're aware of researchers working very specifically on this aspect, which is loss of income. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And whether that those, there are people you're aware of or nice bits of work or meta reviews that are looking at that particular area. Uh, uh, I don't, I, very good question, Rebecca, because, you know, uh, this clearly is, you know, uh, central to, you know, people's experience, for example, of um, um, uh, flood risk and the rest of it. Uh, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, uh, but mm. let us, but drop us, drop me a line and we'll I'll get be back to you Thank on you. that. And I'll have to sort of think about it unless in the next segment, which Kat is about to introduce, if she can think of something off the top of her head, then uh, that would be really good. But I think it is a good point that this is, you know, uh, uh, this has economic dimensions as well as social dimensions. And that mm. in itself is, you know, one of the big, you know, traumas and distresses associated with the sort of consequences. Um, I'll take uh, Deborah and then that'll have to be the last one and we'll move on. Thank you very much for uh, all that you shared. I feel it's so important that we pub have a public conversation increasingly about the social consequences of climate. Mm -hmm. um, and the stresses of um, of responding, but also what would happen if we didn't respond. So mm -hmm. all of this preventive action has been to uh, to protect people from worse stresses and worse uh, mental health and practical and economic mm -hmm. problems. So I think that's the context, isn't it? I'm coming at this from a social work perspective mm -hmm. um, and I'm part of the climate child protection um, group nationally, which will be presenting at the national conference this year of social workers up in Edinburgh um, about the implications for children of, and, mm -hmm. and children's well-being and safeguarding uh, all children um, facing the future in this in this time. I wonder if you can point to anything that we can use um, specifically about about future generations and and the impact on them. Um, uh, again, uh, Deborah, I think uh, best to uh, drop me a line and I'll share it with our team and we'll uh, come back to you on that. I mean, <laughs> one of the things that that you know is receiving a lot of attention, of course, or you know is high on people's sort of discourse without really knowing much about it. And I, you know, and I confess I'm in this position itself, is the idea that that there is this eco-anxiety, that there is a sort of existential, you know, a, 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 an idea of, you know, um, uh, that climate change is going to change people's futures and that really affects younger generations in particular because they're going to be living through the century. And this is something that's been bequeathed to them by us, I'll call us as a generation on this call, uh, whatever generation we are. Um, uh, I think, so there is quite a lot on, of work on uh, an emerging body of work on eco-anxiety within uh, youths and adults. Uh, and obviously there, 
social response to that through climate activism and you know a positive um uh, engagement through climate activism that sort of thing uh, but i think it does go beyond uh you know eco anxiety um you know i i think that's one you know very specific framing and you can almost sort of put it in a box so i think what you're dealing with is uh, much wider than that but i'll not say more than that but drop us a line and we'll try and respond uh, more fully uh, mm -hmm. let me then pass on to uh, my colleague uh, Catherine Butler at the University of Exeter for the next stage. Thanks.